Hello, and welcome back to Private Markets 360, S&P Global's podcast dedicated to enlightening and educating our listeners about the world of private markets from vast vantage points. Your Private Markets 360 co-hosts both sit within market intelligence. I'll start off with introductions. I'm Jocelyn Lewis, Head of Private Debt Commercial Strategy. And I'm Jocelyn's co-host, Chris Sparenberg, Head of Private Markets Commercial Strategy. I'm a super fan of our corner of the investment industry. I'm excited to be joining the podcast. We're thrilled to bring our listeners exciting guests every month for discussions about industry trends and other topics of interest here on the podcast. We sure are, Chris. And if you're interested in regular private markets content, hit subscribe and tune in. Ready to introduce our guest, Chris? Let's do it. Today's guest has been working within private credit for most of her career and currently serves on several nonprofit boards, is a founding member of the NYU Stern Private Equity Advisory Board, and is the CEO and managing partner of Turning Rock Partners. Welcome, Maggie Arvidland, to Private Markets 360. Maggie, how are you today? I'm doing great, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for hosting me today. Absolutely. We are thrilled to have you as today's guest to talk about the booming private credit market that's estimated to have AUM of over $1.5 trillion, which will exceed the broadly syndicated loan market by the end of the year. Unbelievable. Absolutely. It is really wild to see it grow and mature as an asset class, particularly as we've seen that similar rise in other private related market areas. That's great. Maggie, I want to start us off by talking about M&A. One of the drivers of deal activity for private credit has been the financing required for M&A. And with weaker M&A volumes this year, less attractive market multiples, what's your view on how M&A activity is impacting private credit? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris, and thanks for bringing it up. I mean, at the end of the day, in lower growth, more inflationary environments like the one we're in today, M&A plays a vital role for companies looking to drive growth outside of just organic growth. And unfortunately, given the macroeconomic outlook today, which we're fairly negative on, just given where rates are, given where overall growth is, and ultimately, you know, the, the health and wellness of households and corporates today M&A has been, up until six months ago, a really vital way to accomplish growth. And what we saw in the first half of this year, very much correlated with the hike in rates, was that it became far less appealing for private equity-backed companies to take on leverage. Number one, they tend to take on more leverage due to their sponsor involvement. But number two, the, the cost of that leverage became somewhat untenable. So we've really seen a pullback in what I would describe of as true LBO-backed activity. Fortunate for us, we focus on more of the founder-owned or founder-led space. So our deal flow is typically less impacted. But very much, we, we saw that retrenchment. And it was also, I'd say, exacerbated by the pullback from the banking market as well. You know, kicked off in the spring by SVB. And of course, you know, perpetuated through now forced asset selling, um, you know, the, the deposit base at most U.S. commercial banks is very fragile and certainly becoming more risky when you consider the small and regional banks. And so the combination of both, you know, less available capital from the sponsor backed market, which had really been very much a bedrock, you know, within the private market arena, combining that with bank market fragility and ongoing vol has really hampered many companies' abilities to find that capital to pursue the M&A that they need. I also think that there still continues to be, or we continue to see this valuation disconnect between buyers and sellers. And when you look at some of the portfolio companies that you're in, and maybe some of the projected exits that maybe some of the sponsors had originally underwrote, are you still seeing this disconnect? Or do you see it consolidating at all? Mm, it's, it's very interesting. No, I think the bid ask remains wide. So I think a few things have happened. Number one, if we if we go back in time a bit, right? Prior and during to COVID, you know, you really saw a pullback in fixed investment, right? It was pandemic times, companies were very uncertain. They weren't certain about their growth needs or their capital needs. And so you saw a pullback in both hiring and fixed investment. Coming out of the pandemic, right, there was this drive, this absolute need to do that. And then of course, markets hit the brakes when when we had now global global warfare, ongoing strife, and and the banking 
of all that we talked about earlier. And so that bid ask spread, in my opinion, is still very broad. For example, in certain sectors, you are seeing ongoing activity where deals are still getting done. But in general, I think sellers right now are loath to sell equity at these levels until they absolutely have to. Until both seller expectations start to moderate and buyer confidence tends to become more elevated, I think you'll see still fairly hung volumes there. The other thing I would just add, and this gets back to Chris's question on the on the M&A front, I think that higher equity contributions are the new normal now as part of deals. And we're seeing that. But I also see trends in some of the private credit financings you're seeing, even on the back of theoretically higher equity contributions, which would be more credit positive, you are seeing higher fees, you're seeing, I'd say, more punitive structures across the board. Those are some of the trends that we're seeing right now. Completely makes sense. And I guess it could work to your advantage by maybe being in some credits that you like longer. So hopefully that that is a positive. And if we move maybe to looking at from a capital market standpoint, we think of all the macroeconomic turmoil, bank stress, interest rate hikes, inflation, the expectations of a recession or an expected increase in regulation of the private markets. How has that had any impact on your portfolio and your pipeline? So I think you hit our four themes on the head. You haven't even seen our new letter coming out, Jocelyn, but you you took our themes right out. So the first theme for us is is this bank volatility, the banking disruption. So what does that mean? Number one, it means working capital lines have gotten reduced by a wide margin. Number two, commercial lending broadly defined writ large has declined. And flexibility is very low. So that will have ongoing impacts. So across our portfolio, we've been very fortunate. Our our positions have held up very well, but they're not completely immune. We certainly had calls this summer from plenty of our companies saying, I thought I was going to have an upsize in my working capital or my revolver, and now I'm being told I'm going to have a downsize. And what do I do with that? So I think the biggest effect on the banking disruption side has been threefold. And I, I go back to kind of the GFC days for those of us who are investing during that time, counterparty risk becomes, again, a hot topic. Most companies need to have more than one banking relationship. And secondly, they need to have multiple ways to win in terms of capital. So that means being able to, if they're a larger issuer, being able to tap the high yield market if and when open. If you're a more mid-cap issuer, thinking through your shareholder or other incumbent financing sources. And if you're a smaller company, really tapping into your networks to make sure that you've got a number of diversified capital providers. So that's that's on the banking disruption theme. The second theme that we see is around this refinancing wall. You've got a trillion dollars of leveraged loans coming due between 24 and 26, and that all has to get resolved. And so as spreads are widening out in the institutional loan market and credit coverage, interest coverage metrics are declining, and you combine that with a maturity wall coming, again, companies have to somewhat start to resolve these concerns. And so that will lead them to make decisions in the next 12 to 24 months. So I would say maturity-driven catalysts are another big theme. And then lastly, I would say very much this this need for growth or demand-driven capital. So we see many companies today in our portfolio that actually want to lean in in the current market. You know, they might see a competitor that might not have the capital stability, but perhaps has great customers or perhaps owns a great set of assets. So we really want to be constructive with our companies to ask them, how can we help you both gain market share, but also take advantage of either horizontal or vertical integration in your key market? That's a good way to build pipeline too, by always looking to see what can be accretive to any of the existing portfolio companies that might not have been so, it might not have been part of the underwriting basis, but now given where the economy is, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that we source opportunities is I think a bit differentiated than our peer groups. I'm sure you talk to lots of different fund managers out there, but the first thing that we do very much is talk to prior management teams. So we financed over 4 billion of opportunities in the last 10 to 15 years as a team. And so we have pattern recognition. So we really look for companies that are founder led or owned. They tend to have enterprise values between 100 and 500 million, and they tend to need between 20 and 75 million of, of financing per opportunity. And so 
We're regularly maintaining a database and we're very tech enabled at Turning Rock, I'm proud to say, a database of those companies. And prior management teams are a very large and disciplined, repeatable source of flow for us. Banks right now, absolutely shedding assets, absolutely a deal source for firms like us. And of course, we're always in the market talking to intermediaries, whether those be estate attorneys or lawyers or accounting firms, really anyone that has networks into the family owned or, or operated space. So thankfully, it's, it's a robust pipeline. And we think our opportunity set ahead for firms like us is over $3 trillion, actually. We think the demand for structured capital is really at that size at this point. That's a huge number. And Maggie, continuing on that theme, it seems on the LP side, interest in private credit is, is at a higher level than it's been historically. We speak with a lot of our LP clients, and I think a common theme that we hear is they're increasing allocations or they have an interest in increasing allocations to private credit. Oftentimes, they may be looking to managers that they've had a longer existing relationship with. When Turning Rock is competing for capital allocations, what are some of the challenges that you see as an emerging manager? Mm, That's such a good question. Thank you for asking. I think the bigger firms will have the scale advantage in the sense that they have bigger pools of capital and they can tackle, I would describe that, that slightly more syndicated market, right? So typically the bigger funds that are running five or 10 or 15 million billion rather can really go after 250, 500, even billion dollar financings and above. Um, So the one way that we differentiate, Chris, is very much on size. We focus on what we believe is a less competitive area. So these are companies that are typically not ready for a full unit tranche market or a syndicated loan deal. They're not big enough to necessarily tap the high yield market. And so they need something more private or bespoke in nature. So that's the first way in which we compete. The second has to do with the focus on our core and critical sectors. So we focus on things that are more asset heavy, a lower growth, but more predictable. And so that leads us to areas such as communications, transportation, essential business services, et cetera. I also think our sector selection can help us differentiate as well as our geography. We only focus on North America. We're not a global shop. And that means that we focus on you know a, a pretty robust and investable opportunity set here. And we estimate our core market for companies that are eligible at over 25,000 in uh, companies alone in the US. So there's plenty of opportunities for us to look at. Lastly, I think the third main differentiator of how we compete versus others is we really pound the table right now that we should be able to deliver favorable risk-adjusted returns without the use of leverage. And I think that's another competitive advantage. And certainly now, as leverage costs have spiked, you know, that's helping us. I think those are the three main areas that, that we highlight. The final piece I'll mention is just really our emphasis on ESG and DEI. And this is a new thing, right? I mean, in Europe has been leading the way on this for a long time, but we conduct full-blown ESG and DEI reviews on all of our portfolio companies pre-close. And we're prepared to walk away from something if findings in those reports don't meet our thresholds. And so I think if, if we stick to our knitting along both the focus on the smaller end of the market, the focus on the founder-owned and founder-led without the use of leverage at the portfolio level, we feel that that's, that's a way to stick out. And also, I think the growing market provides enough for you know, various players to have opportunity sets. And it seems like there's more and more opportunity coming from the allocator side of the market too. So two good things coming together at the same time. We'll see. Yeah, we're very fortunate. We have a phenomenal bench of LPs that have been with us since the beginning. And we've also brought on some great new limited partners. You know, We learn from them, not only in terms of best practices, but how we can continue to raise the bar every day. We were a founding signatory to the ILPA Diversity in Action Principles back in 2020, and we recently won the best North American female-founded, you know, private alts manager award last year. And so we continue to, we think, just keep our head down on deal execution and build the platform thoughtfully. And we're grateful for, you know, the partners that we have. So if I'm an LP, it sounds pretty compelling to me with the way that you are focused on that lower end of the market, you know where you are playing, you know what the opportunity set is, you're diligent in your underwriting practices, you have the focus on DEI as well. But then when you think about there's other market participants, you probably run up against them when you're actually competing for a specific portfolio company opportunity. How then do you differentiate? Well, a few things. Number one, most of the people on our team have actually been principal investors before. 
So meaning that we've run companies before, we've had to make those CapEx decisions, we've had to build budgets, we've had to take company board seats, we've had to take companies through restructuring. So we have expertise, I think, that resonates with the underlying management team, right, that we're talking to. So that's one way. And I think that comes across in spades when you are speaking to to potential partner companies. The second way that we theoretically compete is sticking to our knitting in terms of the industry selection. And so, for example, when we go in and we issue an LOI, we're often asking for exclusivity from our companies, but we are bringing to bear decades of relevant industry expertise and knowledge. So when they are talking through their customers, we understand those contracts. When they are talking through their collateral backing, we understand how to value those assets. Um, And lastly, we have a network of over 25 men and women. We call them our senior advisors. They have deep domain expertise in the sectors in which we invest. And we often will bring them into our due diligence processes to meet management teams. And those industry veterans oftentimes forge unique bonds with these companies as well that post-close even continue, sometimes even years after our involvement with the company. The marrying of both deep domain knowledge of their industries, our team's principal experience, meaning having walked the walk that they are walking, in addition to the use of our senior advisors, are ways that I think we stand out. Very rarely are we in some sort of competitive process with a company. And if we are, we probably remove ourselves. <laughs> We'd rather work bilaterally with the company to craft a unique customized solution that meets their needs than spend time competing against 12 other shops. It pays to be able to be selective and to get that exclusivity too is really key. And I think with having a network of trusted advisors too, to help you through, if I'm a founder funded business, then I like bringing in some additional expertise to help my vision. The other thing I would say, and you know, we always ask founders, they, they're welcome to call any founders with whom we've worked, but after the hold period with us, many of our companies would, would tell you that they're more institutional in the sense that we demand certain things in terms of reporting. We're often observing their corporate board initiatives We may make suggestions if they are looking for a new service provider or if they want to add diversity to their board or perhaps their CFO is looking to engage with a new counterparty. I mean, there's a myriad of elements. But after a three to five year period with TRP, most of the management teams will tell you that they are far more institutional coming out of that. And that is good for us and our LPs, but it's also good for the companies on the back end. So we view that as a win-win. Well, great, Maggie. I really appreciate all of your insights. This has been some terrific conversation and we really, really appreciate having you on Private Markets 360. So thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn, Chris, and S&P Global. Really appreciate the time today. Have a great day. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you again to our wonderful guest for a great chat today. We really appreciate everyone listening in. If you're looking for more Private Markets content, hit subscribe to catch future episodes and listen to our earlier episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. Cheers, everyone. Thank you so much. You can also subscribe to our monthly Private Markets 360 newsletter. The link is in each episode bio or connect with us on LinkedIn. Have a great day. Information presented is based on Turning Rock's current views of the market landscape. The information should not form the primary basis for investment decisions. No direct or indirect compensation was provided by Turning Rock Partners to PEWIN in connection with obtaining or using the award.